Okay, back to um, Article 2. Mr. Arena moves that we take Article 2 for the table for the purpose of the State of the Town Address. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, and Article 2 is taken from the table. Mr. Arena. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Mr. Moderator, I'd like to request additional time. My presentation should take about 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Is there any objection? None appearing. Continue. Good evening, and thank you to my fellow Board of Selectmen, Town Manager Bob Lelasher, Superintendent John Doherty, Chief Segala, Chief Burns, Reading School Committee members, Town Meeting members, Town and School staff, and the citizens of the Town of Reading. My honor to serve as Chairman of the Board uh, for the coming year. There are three major areas I'd like to cover tonight. First, a review of major board activities over the past year. Second, a discussion of some of the present day challenges and realities the board has been asked to address. And third, to describe the path ahead for the coming year and how the board plans to support it. Since April 2016, the board has undertaken multiple initiatives with long-term beneficial effects for years to come. We proposed senior tax relief, which was then approved by town meeting and ultimately the Massachusetts legislature. The measure, this measure allows lower income seniors qualifying for the state circuit breaker credit, the ability to reduce their property taxes, helping them stay in their homes near friends and loved ones. The, the measure permits a shift of about 2% of the residential property levy, levy under the rest of the class and provides a meaningful reduction in property taxes for eligible Reading seniors. We help define a formal town economic development process, welcoming our new economic development director and designing the process to catalog and market Reading to interested developers, agents, and industries. More on why we did this in a few minutes. We heard local voters last fall when they rejected state ballot question four that legalized recreational marijuana. We worked with CPDC to make sure we understood and closed all possible loopholes before asking town voters if they wished to ban commercial marijuana establishment. Earlier this month, Voters spoke by nearly a 38% margin, and as you heard moments ago, town meeting voted to formalize that decision. A special thanks is due our, to our town council, Ray Miaris, and his firm for their pioneering legal efforts in this area, working closely with state agencies to make sure residents were able to express their views. We supported CPDC efforts to expand the current 40R Smart Growth District to adjacent areas of the downtown, which, as you know, was just approved Thursday evening. The decision also provides a countermeasure to hostile 40Bs appearing in these same areas. We supported CPDC efforts to revise the zoning bylaw pertaining to accessory apartments to, prov to prevent unintended consequences of the original language. The accessory apartment concept was designed to allow parents and relatives to remain independent and living in Reading while in close proximity to family. Together with the trustees, we welcome the opening of our new li Reading Public Library, now returned to a center of community engagement. Thanks to the library trustees, the building com committee, town staff, and especially to the voters of Reading who approved and funded this substantial project. We sent the residential tax factor reflecting the view that residential and commercial properties be treated with parity. A shift to the commercial sector will be discussed in the fall of 2017 in order to equitably share the cost of the senior tax relief discussed a few seconds ago. We reapproved an intermunicipal agreement for regional housing services together with North Reading, Saugus, and Wilmington to effectively manage affordable units in each town using a common resource. This agreement will better support each town to manage the affordable housing stock we work so hard to create. Individual members of our board acting together with strong support of CPDC and ZBA and town staff worked with the proposed Reading Village 40B to mitigate a butter objections. Please bear in mind that due to state 40B regulations, the town of Reading was powerless to stop this project. The final proposal was substantially improved due to the efforts of both day and nighttime government. The project also triggers Massachusetts subsidized housing conditions such that Reading may defer new 40B applications through February of 2018. Note that Reading has several other 40B applications already in progress, and we will apply the same approaches in managing these. I do want to thank uh, former board member Kevin Sexton specifically for his efforts in this area. 
Kevin's business experience and idea generation materially added to the final proposal. Finally, the board called a special election in October 2016 to vote an override to Proposition 2 and a half, last attempted in 2003. Working with the school committee to identify and prioritize needs, the board and town manager, Mr. Lalasher, proposed a comprehensive solution that built in a component of endurance that would have provided us a 10-year operating window minimum. The majority of voters told us overwhelmingly in October our proposal wasn't acceptable. Reading's override discussions will continue in the coming year, which I'll cover in a few, few seconds. Before my comments regarding our future, a few thoughts on the present. Over the last 12 months, our national and state politics have become increasingly polarized. Congressmen, senators, and the White House continue to generate sound bites daily, which are echoed in 24-hour news coverage hyping every thought. With the electronic devices each of us carry today, we're just a click away from fresh news, amplification, and outrage commentary on Facebook and social opinion sites. Disagreement is everywhere. If disagreement is visible everywhere at the national and state levels, whether it's tax policy, cabinet appointments, health care, the wall, Supreme Court nominees, foreign trade, North Korea, Trump, even families themselves report an inability to socialize with certain of their relatives over political disagreements. Allowing these disputes to enter into our town governance process should be handled very carefully. Otherwise, they'll inevitably create objection, friction, and outright argument, and ultimately become a drag on our progress. Earlier this year, our board was asked by more than 200 petitioners for an endorsement of their human rights statement. Selectman Barry Berman and I met with petitioner representatives in two separate meetings and discussed two different statement versions. The meetings were cordial, and I think genuine common understanding on individual topics was evident to me. Our board will continue discussion on these subjects later this month. Our basic freedoms of speech and thought guarantee all of us the right to express opinions on any topic in any medium we choose. I defend that right for citizens to speak their mind, even where I might disagree with the subject matter itself. The question for me is the propriety of elected officials of the town taking voted positions for or against lawful citizen speech. To this very point, the town manager shared with me a discussion with a resident who offered that the human rights statement had our board attempting to take away his rights to criticize President Trump. So it cuts both ways. We live in very interesting times, and walking straight down the center of political Main Street will be challenging for all of us. Let me turn to the challenges facing us in the year ahead. There are two key objectives we must make progress on this year. The first is the override. We must start the process to place a suitably designed override on a future ballot for fiscal 2019. That's going to require substantial effort by the schools and the town to determine needs, appropriate budgets, and develop the necessary background and support materials. We'll need to gauge the public's tolerance levels and allow sufficient time for public commentary and responses. I am committed to bring such an override back to the voters for the fiscal 19 budget. As I is explained further in the town manager's warrant remarks, the ability to deliver town and school services will markedly decline unless new revenues are in place by then. Before we can do that, however, major improvements are needed this year in how we develop and present override information. In particular, a means to survey voter opinions is needed to bring out objections and other inputs from voters to help shape the proposal. Beyond the mechanics of the override, there's also a substantial public relations issue ahead. We must increase the level of trust between the town, the schools, and voters. I heard from multiple voters after the October failure who indicated a lack of trust in what they heard from the town and schools regarding the override size, growth rates, and forecasted spending. Some voters objected to the sheer size of the override as too much, even though on a proportional basis it was a lesser percentage as compared to the successful 2003 override. Some voters were confused over the complexity of the override structure, which was designed to include, again, this element of endurance to extend its life for over 10 years. 
And others took the view that as the town had managed perfectly well for so long, just how bad could the current set of needs be? If taxpayers are expected to pay more in taxes, they'll need to know and agree to what uses these dollars will go and then vocalize their support. They'll also be need to be given the information of potential and real changes to excluded debt balances and their incremental impact on property taxes. In particular, I'm thinking of new debt required for a proposed renovation of Killam and the retirement of earlier debt from the library and high school. To that point, I will commit tonight the Board of Selectmen to provide voters a clear, prioritized summary of the town proposed purposes in an override, what they'll be used for, and our view of the likely future of excluded debt. These summaries will be prepared as part of the normal FY19 budget planning process. I also commit tonight that our board will use the same, at the same time, provide voters with an alternative version, fiscal 19 town budget, identifying reductions in spending required should an override fail. Citizens need to understand the consequences to both success and failure. I ask my colleagues on the school committee this evening to commit to generating these same two views of their fiscal 19 budget. And I would suggest further that our two boards standardize the design of these documents for easier comprehension by voters. On the subject of voter outreach, the world has changed. It doesn't get its news any longer from television and newspapers. It's, it's about web content, mobile devices, and blogging. This year's outreach effort will require greater use of social networking to help spread the information regarding the override, the budget, and related support materials. The town and schools have definite limits into what types and in what medium we may use to make information public. But our data and sources can be copied, amplified, and broadcast by in interested citizens within their own personal networks, and likewise, they can help to funnel questions back to elected officials for general responses. To that point, I would like to acknowledge the members of the Yes for Reading group for their pioneering efforts last year in social networking. To those listening tonight, they would really benefit from a, f a few more volunteers. One core question on the override is size and how to design it to be as effective as possible for as long as possible. In 2016, we put forth a proposal for a seven and a half million dollar override that was defeated by an 18% vote margin. A new sizing effort is required and the board must evaluate the level of support in the voter community to shape that final proposal. A key, input to the process, to the, a key input to the process are the proposed FY19 budget and priority list from both town and schools. We know more about voter expectations entering this year. Much of the priorita prioritizing process developed last year remains useful as we undertake this override effort again. The second objective we must make progress on, excuse me, regarding override frequency and economic development, the evidence is clear that since the 1980 passage of Proposition Two and a Half in the Commonwealth, cities and towns having more commercial property and therefore greater commercial tax revenues simply have not needed to rely on the override ballot as frequently. For peer communities with 87% or more residential property, and for reference, Reading has 92%, we're well above that threshold. 10 of 11, not including Linfield, have asked voters for overrides more often than Reading has. And 10 of 11, not including Stoneham, have passed overrides more recently than Reading has. Conversely, in peer communities with larger commercial property sectors, only one in 14, Westford, has asked more often. And only three in 14, Walpole, Natick, and Canton, have passed an override more frequently. Despite having strong positives of an educated workforce, easy access to two major state thoroughfares, good housing stock, a low commercial tax rate, excellent electric rates, and good schools, Reading has stubbornly remained in the lower quartile. That's the lowest 25% among its peer towns relative to economic development and economic growth. Solving this problem is critical to our long-term future because it creates the alternative revenue source to overrides to help fund town and schools. Some residents tend to dismiss the relative urgency of economic development proposals because of the long time to beneficial results. That's short-sighted in my view. Had the economic development efforts we've started today instead begun 10 years ago, we'd be in a very different place now. 
To say it simply, failing to plan is planning to fail. On the matter of economic development, Reading remains largely a bedroom community. That means residential property taxes are the overwhelming source of property, ta of property tax revenue. Additionally, we have lots and lots of school-aged children. That means on the spend side, higher percentage of our budget dollars go to education. There's nothing wrong with these facts, but it does mean our budgets are under different financial stresses versus our peers. Reading does not have the same income and spending profile other towns have. Our, our residential class size has continued to grow since 2010 with increased numbers of condominiums entering inventory, further increasing our dependence on residential property taxes. Today, two-thirds of all town revenue is derived from property taxes within the Prop 2.5 levy. In 2018, that sum is approximately $64 million. About 91.5% of that will be derived from the residential class and 8.5% from the commercial class commercial, industrial, and personal property class, rounding to the nearest half percent. Let's take a look at Reading relative to 25 peer communities, comparing employment headcount and employment headcount growth as a proxy to measuring commercial development intensity. Jesse Wilson hired as a part-time economic development liaison to complete a 25-town peer community assessment compiled this data. She did a great job. Towns with higher employment traffic driving, them, driving to them represent towns with higher commercial development levels. If you have more employees showing up every day, you've got more commercial development. This is a busy slide. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to simplicate it in a minute. This is a survey of 25 towns along two axes. I'm going to show you one at a time. Here we have Burlington. Burlington has, on an average month, 43,700 people showing up to work in the city. That's why it aligns with the x-axis in this point. Its five-year growth of that 43.7 number is about 4,200 employees. And here's an interesting statistic. Comparing the ratio of number of employees that show up each day to the number of employees within the town that are employable, that is between 19 and 64 years old, 2.7 times as many people arrive in Burlington every day that could be employed within that age bracket. That's an interesting proxy. They are a recipient of employees coming into their town to work. Let's take a look at a couple of other towns. Here's Danvers. On an average month, 26.4K monthly employees show up for work. Their five-year growth in that number is about 1,800. And that number, 26.4, is about one and a half times the number of individuals in that 19 to 64 age bracket, that employable age bracket. Let's take a look at our friend of the south, Wakefield. 14.6K employees, five-year growth of about 1,000. And now the ratios flip to under one. Fewer people are employed than our employable within the town. So where's Reading? 7,000 persons employed, a five-year growth of a whole 513 employees, and under half the number of employable adults in the town are represented in employees that are coming in. We are a donor of employees to other towns. That's the problem. People don't come here to work they come here to sleep and raise families and go somewhere else to work. It's clear Reading has a comparatively low level of average monthly employment to its peers, coupled with a very low growth of employment measured over the five-year term. We're largely a place for citizens to sleep, to eat, and raise families, and then leave to go work somewhere else. We need to reposition Reading as a destination for employees to travel to and spend discretionary dollars on local shopping, food, entertainment, and other purposes. This doesn't mean that we aspire to make Reading into a Woburn or a Burlington. Reading is starting off such a small commercial base that even a medium-sized improvement will yield good benefit to our tax revenues. Our focus must include redevelopment as Reading has a very small amount of remaining open land for new development relative to its peers. Let's take a look at another statistic, this time 
we're going to take a look at the average salary levels of employees that work in our towns. These are the same towns I showed you earlier, except we're going to look at the average wages. Again, these statistics were tabulated by Jesse Wilson. And where is Reading? Let's see. Oh, here we are. In 2010, the average wage was under $40,000, $37,000 a year. The same statistic five years later, we've grown by almost 8%. We're still in last place. Looking at the slide above drawn from the same town analysis, we see that in both years, while our employment grew, we remain last in average employee salary levels, reflecting our predominantly small business and retail type base. Victor Santaniello, our shared assessor with Wakefield, prepared a study for the board also illustrating the same point in a different way. Let me just take a look at the commercial. I talked earlier about the commercial, industrial, and personal property class. Let's look at the C part of that in CIP. So the commercial property class represents a total of about 281 million. This is a st statistic from 2016. That represents, the pie chart shows the total class separated by the number of parcels, parcel valuation, and count. So the 281 million is divided up into a total of five uh, pieces. You'll see that 25 large and very large value properties, primarily those at Walker's Brook, shown here in teal and purple, represent 60% of the total class property value. Six parcels represent 40% alone. The balance of 40% is made up of 170 small and medium valued at properties. To move the needle enough on economic development will require medium and large scale projects and ultimately another Walker's Brook type event. Attracting projects of this size means Reading requires a focused and sustained development management effort led by dedicated town staff. To that end, the, in 2016, the board voted to add a full-time in-house resource for commercial and re redevelopment growth, paid for by revenues from revolving fund permits. Andrew Corona, the economic development director, joined us over the summer and is focused on three key areas. First, to develop our Reading Town brand and related outbound messaging to get us on the map and into the minds of potential companies and developers and commercial brokers. Second, to assist with project visioning and concept developments, including citizen forums and listening sessions for inputs and feedback. And third, to assist in the intermediate steps of project planning to provide town support as needed, such as the two projects here. We spoke the first, shown in purple outlines, was the Article 23 proposal approved Thursday to expand the 40R Smart Growth District. The second, shown in the green outlines, is to assist in the marketing and redevelopment outreach for the industrial segment on Walker's Brook Drive. This area has the best potential for high-value commercial and a significant redevelopment project. There's a lot of work ahead, but even the longest journey starts with a single step. Reading has weathered many challenges over its 373-year his history, and I'm certain brand new issues await us in the coming year. Our future progress and success hinge on our officials and citizens solving these problems carefully, respectfully, and transparently. Thank you for your time, and may God continue to bless the town and citizens of Reading. Good night.